Okay, welcome to Steal Yourselves. Thank you all for coming. This is the third edition of Steal Yourselves, and I'm really excited to have two um, really powerful uh, speakers, two really experienced testers as uh, speakers. Uh, let me tell you what the, the format's about. Uh, essentially, our speakers today are going to do their best to make a case for some position in testing that they disagree with. And that's the absolutely key thing here. They're going to make a case for something that they don't believe. And that's part of the challenge. It's an interesting challenge for them. And it's uh, interesting to listen to us, see them hopefully struggle uh, to make that case, but find ways to make the best case that they can. Um, Eric Pragler is going to talk about best practices being good enough. And Vernon Richards is going to tell us that only a tester can make the test strategy. And hopefully you're already thinking of reasons why maybe you don't necessarily believe those cases. Uh, and that's great because the way it's going to work is this. There'll be 10 minutes um, for Eric first to make his case, then 10 minutes of questions. And in a slight change to the format from the first two steal yourselves, the first couple of minutes of questions are going to go to the other speaker. So Vernon will get the first chance on questions. Then the rest of us will get a chance to go. Uh, and then we'll come back and have 10 minutes of reflection. And that reflection will be on the case they chose to make, any uh, difficulties or insights that they gained from making the case, and then maybe how they felt during the presentation and the questions. So it's 10 minutes to make the case, 10 minutes of questions, 10 minutes of reflection. Uh, Eric will go first. Um, as I said, this is the third edition. And the first one and second are both available on our YouTube channel. I've got to be honest, they're both great. If you didn't uh, attend or see them, please do um, take a good look at those. Uh, While well, I've got you here, and I know we've got um, quite a few uh, non-members uh, attending Steal Yourselves, um, let me just give you a minute or two on what the Association for Software Testing is about. Um, we're a member organisation, and there's a bunch of benefits to being members. I'm not going to go into them all now. You'll find this list on our website. Um, we offer a pay what you can afford membership uh, system. Um, so the first three levels, the regular membership, um, at $10, $50, and $100 a year, all offer the same benefit. And what we ask is that you pay the number that you can afford. So if all you can afford is $10 a year, we're very happy to have you at $10 a year. But if you're uh, in a better financial position, you can afford 50. That would be great too. And the money that you give us supports events like this. Um, we're also, uh, as well as the uh, the webinars that we do, we're into it's training. Hi, oh, oh, Lisa. Oops. Uh, we're, <laughs> we're, we're into, our, uh, into, into trading and we run the world-renowned black box software testing courses with our partners, Altum. Uh, we offer three um, courses for students. The foundations course, which is the one on which the others are built, uh, gives you really good um, background in testing. Uh, we offer test design and bug advocacy. And all three of those courses are small cohort, um, three or four week courses, and they're all remote. Uh, you get reviewed by your peers and also assistance from experienced practitioners who are the instructors on the course. Um, I can thoroughly recommend them. Uh, if you enjoy those, uh, then you might want to become an instructor and we run a, a volunteer group of instructors to help other people to come through our courses. Uh, we've got our CAS conference coming up in November. Uh, it's in the, the NASCAR Hall of Fame. If you're a car racing fan, that's a great location. And if you're not, it's still a great location. Uh, in Charlotte. Uh, the theme this year is context team and what, what it's about in a nutshell is you can be the best tester in the world but you aren't going to get everything done even if you try for your team. Uh, software is uh, a multi-person game. It's not the, There's no superhero tester that's going to just solve all the problems. So how do you work in a team? How do you bring your team with you in the direction that you want to take testing and so on? Uh, we don't have the uh, lineup available just yet so we're still on the early bird phase so get in now at that link uh, and get your early bird tickets okay that's it steal yourselves is coming up we've got eric pragler 
first, and then Vernon Richards. Eric, up to you. Over to you. Thank you. Get my crutches ready. Okay. All right. So I'm here to talk about uh, why best why best practices are good enough, at least in some contexts. Uh, so this is me. Um, I used to work with with AST quite closely on the board. Um, I'm still involved in uh, testing uh, these days, but I've moved more into the DevOps space, where I'm thinking about automation and test environments and uh, developer experience and things like that. Uh, I'm still involved in uh, in the workshop for performance and reliability, so I'm probably best known for my work in the performance testing space, but I've been around AST since the 2000s, so I've gotten to see a lot of the things that have happened in the context-driven community. Oh, and to the last point, um, if you're uh, the social justice tank, the variation on a social justice warrior, if you have a problem with somebody I'm about to identify as a problem, but... We don't have to worry about that here, not in our community, which is very welcoming and, and inclusive. So let's talk about why we're here. Uh, we're, is, the reason why it's steel and not straw is because it's, it's a very serious approach to how you might learn more about a subject. If I can explain reasonably and faithfully the best version of the argument against my position, then I then I can truly understand it. And uh, this is something that even... Um, even early in the days of context-driven testing, Kem Kaner used to talk about is that um, intellectual honesty involves engaging with the best version of the argument against your position, not cherry-picking aspects of the worst. So hopefully, we're going to learn from it, and we're not here to we're not here for combat. You know, steel sounds like you're getting ready for ready for battle, and uh, there is an exchange. But, you know, a lot of times debate is code for I'm going to yell at you about all the ways that you're wrong. And it's it's a it's not about learning more. Hopefully we have more of the kind of experience where we can entertain ideas we don't agree with. That's the sign of a true intellect. Or as John Scalzi has more um, succinctly put it, there's um, you can fail at being clever. It's not hard. So let's consider the premise of of. Uh, why uh, context-driven testing um, has uh, said so much about the, the problem of best practices. Um, this is uh, one of the very principles of the context-driven school is that um, we, we, re we reject the idea of uh, what people call best practices because context is more important than, than practice. And we've labeled um, behaving as if a practice will always work, no matter what the context is context imperial. And there, there's other ways that we've uh, approached this. Uh, but it really is hard to separate that from being um, context driven. I mean, that's literally the name. You know, the, we, we consider the context when I decide how I want to test something. If I, uh, if, I, uh, if I enter a situation with some humility and I'm not certain what the right thing to do is before I learn more about the problem I'm solving, then my skill and experience can guide me to the right thing. As a craftsperson, I want to be able to uh, give a project what it needs, not what I want to give everything, because it's what I know. It's, it's, that's kind of analogous to the best programming language is the one I'm the most comfortable in, or the best tool is the one I'm most familiar with. The idea is, if I'm a true craftsperson, I can select from a variety of tools for the circumstances I find myself in to, to select the best approach. So let's think about context. And this is how we're going to, uh, we're gonna decompose best practices a little bit. So here's a situation where somebody might say, what are best practices? Well, somebody is under pressure. Somebody who pays them money and controls their future mm -hmm. would like them to test something. You have to decide how you're gonna test it. And the assignment may come with uh, some overhead in terms of what people people's expectations about testing or how they've seen testing be performed before. They may not uh, be familiar with the idea of considering context, or they may have only seen one style of testing. So, so inserting, um, inserting the, 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 the concept of fitting practice to context into a, what's probably a pretty short discussion about testing under pressure could be difficult. So what brings clarity to people who are in this, this sort of situation? Um, I don't know what I want, 
but there's an authoritative source, or at least one that appears so, that I can consult and it tells me what I could do. That starts out being the most credible approach I'm aware of for how to solve a problem I don't really understand. If I am a tester and I need to explain to somebody why I should, why I want to do things a certain way, um, if they respond to a best practices label, that might be an effective tool to get to, to get some alignment instead of having to uh, continue to explain why you can't do the thing they think you ought to be doing. We should also consider the fact that context-driven testing is not is separate from context-driven testers. There are more and more projects these days that don't have dedicated testers on those projects. So I'm advising somebody about how to go about testing. They might have very little experience with testing, or they may have experience with testing from a developer perspective, which is very much a binary, uh, this passes or it doesn't, they all pass or they don't, as opposed to um, some of the, the other techniques we learned to explore, that, that we've learned to explore with and to find out more about the project we're working on and to uncover things that are uh, assumptions and things that we don't know. Um, if you're assigned to work, on, to work on a testing project, you probably don't have months to prepare. You may not even have weeks. You wanna demonstrate that you can make a difference quickly. And even if that's to present a test plan, that involves describing some aspect of test strategy. And you know, it's nice if you can work in a good culture where there's, there's patience and safety, um, most of us have not been able to work that way in our whole career. And in fact, it's rarer than it ought to be that you can find a culture that will say, how long do we need for testing? Let's take that long. It's far more likely that testing is going to be delivered as a time boxed activity that uh, needs to start two weeks ago. Sorry, we didn't invite you to that meeting and needs to be ready to execute on when the code is complete, surely later than the milestone that has been put into the project plan. In all of these circumstances, where somebody who is not an experienced or skilled craftsperson, what do they do? Where do they find help? How do they get started? So the people who could really help them, and there, there's several several of us on this call that I respect greatly, and that I would feel good about any project that they were they were there to contribute on. We can't be everywhere. There are many more testing projects than there are um, context-driven testers. And there are many more testing projects than there are experienced and skilled test architects. So how do we help them? And the people working in those contexts can't just quit. This is something that's, that's appeared in rhetoric before about how to deal with uh, a situation or culture that you don't wanna work in. And that's great if you have the privilege to be able to walk away from a paycheck. Uh, most people don't and they have to figure out how to make it work. So if there's a best practice and it will help, even if it isn't exactly what they want, but it will let them get unblocked and people will stop yelling at them, maybe that's what they need to do. And at the end of the day, it's been very few enlightened leaders who truly appreciate what testing is. It's a, certainly a smaller subset than the ones who claim to. Very few engineering leaders or product, or product leaders I've known truly appreciate the, uh, the benefit of a feedback loop that reduces ambiguity and uh, helps us learn. They don't see that as an activity about testing. They see that as a product experimentation process or part of a development process or something you handle with canary releases where you show a few people something and either ask them about it or measure how they interact with it, with the software that they're working with. Rarely um, have people in general in the software industry been exposed to a tester who can give you a detailed uh, report on what they found and what's, am what's ambiguous still, where there are mismatches between expectations and reality, the way that somebody who's been, tr been trained as a, as a skilled tester can do. So in the context of all of this, I know I'm like recursing that word maybe too many times. Um, we have, we are members of the context-driven community. We would like testing to be a friendlier place where we can do great work. Um, as we engage with other people who work in testing, we uh, at times have not been particularly helpful. You know, yelling at Rex Black didn't never solved anything. It might have felt good. Did it help anyone? Did it? I think it marginalized us. I think it uh, context-driven testing as a brand has some 
negative weight from beating up straw men like best practices. Uh, this idea that I can just tell you all the ways that automation can go wrong leads to people thinking context-driven testing doesn't respect test automation. I deeply, I'm deeply involved in test automation. I think about it all the time. I design systems for automated testing all the time, and I'm a context-driven tester. It's just not true. But that's the impression that uh, that that telling me all the ways that something could be misused can leave. You know, if we tell somebody, oh, you shouldn't do that. You should use your skill and experience. Well, helpful if you have it or if you have access to it. I think uh, time would be another, another component, which is ever present in testing and is rarely uh, talked about in our rhetoric around testing, but is absolutely dealt with when, it come, when the rubber meets the road and we're on a real test project. Uh, some people have tried to replace best practice with, with heuristic because heuristics, the definition of heuristic um, can include something like fallible, and it leaves room for a best practice to be wrong. Um, to me, it's pretty much the same thing. I think when people say a best practice, they mean something like heuristic. They don't mean they're going to put, they're going to cover their eyes and blindly carry out the thing that they were taught once in an ISTQB course. Of course, they're going to adapt to context. Who wouldn't do that? We're not robots. And assuming that we are, or behaving as part of your argument structure that people are not capable of adjusting to the circumstances they're in is, I don't think it's, uh, meets the standard of engaging with somebody's best argument. But best practice is a pattern, is a, is a pattern documentation. Then that can be very helpful. I use that, that one a lot more than I use heuristic because patterns is understood. So when I write uh, when I write out what I think are um, standards and practices and patterns for CI at our, at the place I'm working now, I use the word pattern a lot. Here's a set of here's a set of things you can do and tools and processes that hung together have worked in the past, and it by that framing it invites people to take what they can use and leave what they don't want and adapt it to the circumstances they have. That's how you help people. You help people by giving them tools that they can use and telling them that all of the tools that are sitting around that might help are useless or worse than useless is not helping them. So how are we as context-driven testers, as people who would like to see testing be, a pre be thought of as something that a skilled person does, how are we gonna help people who just need help with testing? It's not gonna be by yelling at them. And that is my 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Eric. Very smooth, uh, as I would have expected. So we're on to around 10 minutes of questions. Uh, remember, Eric is still in the role of this is the case that he's making. So please ask challenging questions. Uh, the first couple of minutes goes to Vern. And then if you put your hand up, if you're happy to come on screen, uh, and ask a question yourself, please do. Um, if you prefer to type it, then I'll ask it on your behalf. Um, Vern. You're, you're muted. What do, you, what do you do when you're in a situation where the best practice doesn't work? So what do I do if I'm trying to change the direction of the team and the way that if they're approaching something that isn't working, I have to be able to show them how it doesn't work. I have to be able to show them this uh, either directly, here's an outcome we're experiencing that's not that's not what we want. Or I have to either, uh, the alternative is to demonstrate knowledge of the practice they'd like to pursue so that I can explain to them when it works and when it doesn't from my perspective. And if I if I can, it's hard to get that step of remove where we're talk about, talking about a practice and a hypothetical as opposed to the project that we have. So it probably would start with that first approach of, is this serving us? And it, it, and, and then the assumption is it, it's probably helping, but which parts, you know, what do we need to change to make it more helpful? If it's, if it's, if it's best, it must always be serving you, surely. Well, I mean, if, if, you, if you take the word best literally, and you can't use the word best unless you mean one of a million, um, all ranked by some agreed upon 
set of measures. Oh wait, I'm doing the thing where I'm not keeping my straw, my steel man up. Yes, um, I think best practices needs to be lowercase b, and it's not be, best practices uh, has have come up in other fields where it where they've been helpful for people who are, don't have a lot to go on or are not very uh, not very skilled. And they become hindrances to people who are very skilled. Which part, which group has more members? Okay, I will, I will cede the floor to the group. Uh, thank you for kicking us off. Does anyone have a question for Eric? So I'll, I'll ask you one, Eric, while we're, oh, yes, but you go, please. I'll just lower my hand here. So I would say, so you, I think you would say that uh, there is a context where best practices would apply. What could be an example? I think well, I would go farther. I would say mm -hmm. in most contexts, big uh, in most contexts, things present, presented as best practices are helpful. Mm -hmm. that there are exceptions and you can define either a hypothetical or cite a realistic case where a given best practice might not help. But, you know, a hammer is a very useful tool that you will be able to use in a variety of circumstances. It's not always the best tool, but it's usually effective. How about, can I do a follow-up? Uh, how about uh, life sciences? They have a, um, a term of best practices that are encoded in some standards. Do you have any experience on that? I do, actually. I did work in a, in a life, for a life sciences software company. And I think the term they used were like, cl like clinical good practices. Like they tried to, that yeah. was another yeah. area. That's an area I'm thinking of that softened on best practices and had some things that were encoded as have to do this. And we would use the, um, I guess that that's the king chess piece if it's liability, as the if queen is revenue, and that was why mm. you would need to do things a certain way. All right, thank you. Uh, thanks, Jesper. Uh, Shema, you were next. Okay, um, there's something that caught my eye. You you were talking about time and patience on the management side, and then you were kind of making. Uh, distinction between skills and uh, experience versus being good at automating stuff. Uh, I'd like to connect these things because if you want to gain one or the other, which is skill, automation is a skill as well, in my opinion, you need to get time. So if you start as a new person, you probably need to get some time to learn. You need to good mentoring what would be your approach to give people that just learning the testing to grow up uh, to increase their skill as a test automator or to get test automation prioritized as part of a project uh, automation is a skill oh well um hmm. i think that most test case definitions that people start out with aren't need reduction to be implemented in test automation, but you, that's still a really good foundation to have the idea of understanding a system state and what is the measurement you want to take or what is the what is the inspection that you're doing. I think when people understand that, then the coding stuff, that's easy. I, I mean, people over index on that, like I need to learn Ruby, I need to learn Python. Yeah, sure, you will. You need something real to work on and that's how you'll learn it because you'll have to, you, you need to do it. So I, I think that if I'm going to make a good test automation program, I have to understand coverage. I have to understand um, how to prioritize that coverage and then how to engage with, you know, when is this, when can the system be made to give me something that feels like a true false answer versus when is the system teaching me something or giving me feedback that I can uh, apply for, for further attack. Did you want to come back, Shame, or are you okay with that? No, I'm okay for now. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alex, you're next. Thank you. Um, Eric, you, you say best practices are, are good enough in the contexts that you just described. 
but I know that they are not formulas for success. Um, they do have the potential to fail. And when somebody inexperienced or uh, uh, uses one of those practices and they fail, it can land them in more trouble than um, they, they, they were initially or makes them lose confidence in themselves, thinking they're not good enough. Um, and I believe that those people who take best practices at face value still need to know the fail, uh, fallibility of these practices. And how do you prepare people to who resort to best practices for the potential failure um, of the practice when they're presented as best? I think that's a, I think that's a little bit reductive to assume that somebody is not capable of assessing whether something's working or not or is not open to the possibility that it might not work. I mean, a best practice may give them a place to start. They might not have any other alternative to uh, to even, especially if they're inexperienced, to even know, where, you know what, what's, what's point, eight, what's step one. So I, I think that if you put somebody in that position, having some pattern that they can follow or best practice, if you will, can get them unstuck and get them on the road to learning something. But if you're inexperienced, you're going to make mistakes. I make I, I make many mistakes every day still after decades of work. Can't protect people from every mistake. They're going there are going to be errors. Okay, thanks. A question in the chat for you, Eric, from Dan. Uh, to what extent are best practices just obvious versus needing to be learned or discovered? Oh, I would say that if you've learned or discovered them, then you're saying they're a best practice is reusing a rhetorical tool to force people to get in line and do what you want them to do. And that's, that is often how the term best practices may be misused to end discussion or to assert uh, authority that may or may not exist. Um, hmm. I, there's another part of your question and I, I, I've lost that I wanted to come back to. Could you restate Could you restate it? Yeah, sure. To what extent are best practices just obvious? Versus... Oh, yeah. yeah. Many of them are. So if they're too obvious, then people are going to next, next. Yes, I understand. I should probably um, connect to the system. Yeah, that's a best practice. Got it. Uh, I mean, hopefully a, a, a practice or a pattern helps somebody um, increase their knowledge or at least gives them some ideas. Uh, I, I love to read about, I love to read about best practices actually, so I can go through it and see what new ideas I can, I can cherry pick for something else. Like, oh, that's a good idea. I've never thought of that before. I like it, but it's not like, uh, we had a cast talk last year where somebody talked about using models to generate Cypress tests. I got three cool things out of it. N um, it was not, I should go implement this model structure so I can implement the Cypress library so that I can auto-generate my tests. I thought that was a bad idea, but I did I did get some techniques out of that that I thought were pretty interesting. Um, this is going to be the last question because your 10 minutes are up. Uh, just because you got something from something someone said doesn't make the thing they said a best practice. I mean, that's, that's what all transfer of knowledge is, right? Like, and we're supposed to be epistemologists, aren't we? There's knowledge that you have from firsthand that, you, that that based on the experiences you've had. But anytime you're trying to share with somebody, it's inherent that they don't have the same context that you do. If you're going to blow the whistle on best practices because they're from a context that's different than yours, that is 100% true every time. Okay, the point I was trying to make um, was being able to take a handful of things cherry picked from something described as a best practice doesn't make it a good practice. It might have been a good practice for. Oh, wait, sorry, I'm still still meaning. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, best practices do have to keep evolving. I don't think that they uh, what the best thing to do in 2005 is relevant today. I tell people that I'm work for the CI stuff I'm working on today is I want to get you to 2015 so that we can next get to 2025. Let, let's stop there. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, that was great. You now have the floor again for uh, 10 minutes or so, let, less if you prefer, just to reflect on the experience that you've been through from the point where you thought about your topic to the end there. Oh, I've definitely um, participated in competitive dunking. Um, that's a, you know, a con uh, context-driven testing thing. I'd like to think I've outgrown it, 
but I've written blog posts about like how to, how, you know, there's no best practice for mashed potatoes and, you know, and I'll, I'll scold people, uh, scolded people for best practices. Now I try to gently nudge them maybe, or I'll say something like, oh, do you know, uh, do you know what environment that worked in? And I, I try to uh, do my part a little more softly these days. Um, so I guess I'm separating the, um, as uh a member of context context driven testing and maybe even a leader for par, uh, for parts of the last decade i feel i have some regrets about how i um, thought about testing and empathy for people who were just wanted to figure out what to do and the more the more the more i met people who were truly didn't know where to start and got to be a little bit i got to be a little more humble about yeah i've worked on this for 15 years uh, these people haven't why would I assume they know what I do? How do I go meet them where they are? So I was very ripe for this assignment um, to think about um, why why do people pick best practices? I mean, when I was running with when I was uh, run, when running uh, AST, I was thinking a lot about why do so many people take an ISTQB test and why do so few want to come take black box software testing? Because certainty is very attractive to people. Certainty reduces cognitive load. Some people really like to think, a lot of people don't. A lot of people have other things to think about. So that um, reflecting on that and reflecting how people other than me think about how to solve problems, uh, I thought that was really helpful. What was the, uh, Shimra, I'll come to you in a second. What was the, um, the part that you, uh kind of Kate in the case that you made today that you felt uh this is an icky part I really don't like saying this hmm I think I managed to say to to say things I I'm willing to defend that the things I'm saying are true for some people at some times and if somebody has a different perspective like most disagreements that's a matter of framing we don't actually disagree about the color of the sky. So I don't actually have anything I think is gross. Um, I think I, I think I um, referenced old politics and um, stuff that most people these days probably don't care about. But to me, that's part of my experience with like the pre-ministry of test when testing was a little, had sharper, uh, sharper elbows, the kind of things that were going on, you know, five, 10, 15 years ago. Thanks. Uh, Shema, did you want to ask a question? Uh, I'm not sure if this is by protocol, but uh, Eric, you mentioned why don't so many people come to AST to learn about testing, but they choose ISTQB. I will go back to my question about time, because AST BBST course is four weeks, and it needs a lot of investment and, and work. And I cannot say that there's probably less amount of work when you do a CQB, but maybe it's easier than what we what ST is offering. Well, structure feels safer. Um, a lack of ambiguity might feel less challenging, but I mean, it takes years to get good at anything and any certification. Oh, wait, I'm, I'm off the clock now. Yeah, any certification scheme is designed to sell you on how fast you will level up if you take that course. And ISTQB um, is giving you like a college, uh, like, a, like a freshman university course structure of I'm going to cram knowledge unit by unit into your head and you're going to pass the test and now you're going to think you're an expert because, you know, you're, in, you're 18 or 19 and you think you know everything. Which is very different than I've worked on six testing projects in two or three different shops. And now I, now I'm really starting to understand like how broad this field really is. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Eric. That was a uh, really excellent work. Um, Vern, you're up. Okay. Can you hear me folks? Okay. Oh, hold on. You're kind of in the way of my slides hold on always in okay so i'm going to talk to you about why only a tester can make 
the test strategy. So many a true word is said in jest. So uh, I, this, this diagram is a, this image is a favorite of mine. And, and whilst um, I think the originator of this image uh, meant many of this stuff as a joke, I actually think it contains quite a lot of uh, truth and truths that can help us understand why testers are the best people to create a test strategy. And I'm gonna run through some of those things uh, right now. So developers. Now, the thing with developers is um, I've, I've, I've worked at a few, a few different companies and, and lots of different contexts. And generally speaking, uh, the developers do believe that they are um, smarter than everybody else, let's say. And they are prone to be attracted to the newest, shiniest technologies. And they're trying to engineer the most perfect uh, machine. So if, if you were to leave the strategy to um, a developer to work on, I think you'd find that it would focus a lot on tools and tools and tools. They would obsess about technology. Um, I also think they would probably be a bit myopic around functional correctness. And I think, I think that's a problem because it, they would ignore lots of other risks that exist beyond functional correctness. So that's what I think the challenge is with developers. I think, I think they are prone to over-engineer all the things and get distracted by a new shiny. And then we have our, our designer pals. Um, and in my experience, they are more concerned about how wonderful and artistic and beautiful something will will look um almost to almost forgetting the people that are actually got to use this thing or and definitely forgetting the people that have to build it and so i think that i think the big risk here is that they would ignore how this thing was is going to be used. And they would be much more interested in expressing themselves and coming up with something that was very, very creative and beautiful and wonderful to, to look at. And there wouldn't be any uh, thought to how practical is this thing to, uh, to build and use. And then we have our, our PM friends. The way, the way that I've interacted with a lot of project managers over the years is they are predominantly focused on two things, two things only. Is this thing on time and is this thing on budget? And so that really focuses where their attention is all the time. And what I've found is they won't really be thinking about, well, are we even building the right thing? So long as it's on time and it's on budget, that's all they care about. And so their strategy would, would miss challenging the project itself and challenging whether we're even, even building the right thing in the first place. And then we have our sys admin pals who are in control of all the things. Now, they generally speaking think most people are clowns and morons. And so success for them is that nothing changes, nothing breaks. The best way to ensure that nothing breaks is to not change anything. Now that's gonna be a problem <laughs> because if we don't ship anything, the whole enterprise is gonna suffer and fail. So I think you would struggle if, if those folks were uh, responsible for the uh, test strategy. Now, that brings us on, of course, to the testers. Now, the testers are indeed like the Avengers because we have 
many, many, many skills that our teammates do not possess. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attempt to run through these as quickly as possible in 10 minutes as I possibly can, because we're so talented and amazing that there are a lot to get through. So first we have Nick Fury. And what Nick Fury represents is our ability to strategize and have strategies within strategies and, and our flexibility and our adaptability. And then we have uh, Captain America. And he is a very selfless hero. And I like to think that many of my testing colleagues are also very selfless and we are here for the users. We're not here for ourselves. We are here for the users and the customers of our products and services. And that brings us on to uh, perhaps the polar opposite, which is Iron Man, who let's say has a healthy disdain and a healthy dis disregard for authority. And I like to think that when you give a rule to us testers, we respectfully find ways to work our ways around it that our, our teammates probably, probably wouldn't do. And then we have, uh, <laughs> we have Black Widow. Now, I didn't include Black Widow because she, her name is a bug. You see what I did there? Black Widow. But okay, if you've got to explain it, it's not very good. Um, nice. No, uh, what, <laughs> what Black Widow is good at is adopting different personas so that she can learn more information about the situation that she is in. And that is something that all of my testing pals are very good at. But sometimes what is required is just plain and utter destruction and smashing, which is what my friend the Hulk here represents. But usually the thing that we crush is everybody else's delusions and confidence and things of that nature. We are here to remove illusions. Uh, and that brings us on to uh, our very handsome friend. Now, not to say that uh, obviously all the testers I know are handsome, beautiful individuals. Uh, but what Thor is good at is the use of tools. And we are expert in tools. We don't get dazzled and we only stick to one tool uh, like our developer friends uh, may do. No, we use a variety of tools in our day-to-day -day work. Let's check the time situation here. I've got to rattle through these. Uh, <laughs> uh, and Hawkeye, what Hawkeye represents is the ability to kind of step back and survey the scene before diving in to the minutiae of the thing that we are working on. Uh, we have the vision. And what vision uh, is good at is we don't get overly attached to things. Like we don't get overly emotional about things like perhaps our project manager friends do or our designer friends do. We can, at the appropriate time, we can take the emotion out of what we're doing and look at things very, very logically. Uh, and we have the Scarlet Witch related to the Hulk. We like to do the unpredictable. We are not, uh, you know, the stay in your lane kind of people um, like the cis admins might be, you know, oh, we can't do that. That'll be too dangerous. It's like, no, let's go and change reality because we've got to find out what the hell's going on here. And then last but not least is the Falcon, the ultimate wingman. If you need someone to help you in a pinch, this is the person that you call and that is the same for us testers. Now, another final thing that I want to try and squeeze in is the fact that, you know, how many of us have worked on a project where we've got all the time in the world, everything is absolutely wonderful, we've got time to teach and coach and, you know, ask people questions. That is not, that doesn't represent any project that I've ever been on, okay? Time critical all the time. And so that means we have to just tell people what to do because we haven't got time for this crap. We haven't got time to put it to a vote. We haven't got time to, you know, help people learn on their own. No, time is money and we don't have any of that crap to waste. So it's just far better if we lead the way and just pull people along with us and build the strategy rather than ask people to do a bad job and it will waste time that we do not have. And folks, that is the end. I know that you'll agree with me, so please 
send your affirmative uh, statements and comments into the chat. And I'm sure there'll be no questions whatsoever. But in case you do, um, it's over to you, James, and Co. Uh, thank you, Vern. That was great fun. And Eric, you get the first couple of minutes for questions. Okay. Um, what What is the trade-off that testers make um, to be to have this kind of flexibility and to have this sort of uh, broader um, frame of reference for engaging with a project? Like, what is it that they 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 give up? And, and aren't able to do or aren't able to participate in? Well, I think because we have a position where we're always here to serve the customer, I think we are less prone to get dragged into um, arguments about um, what is what is the best thing to do or not or is this is this worthwhile and so we are often seen as the voice of uh, reason i would say and so as I, as i said we we kind of put our vision hat on and we kind of say okay let's take the emotion out of this thing and let's just look at this logically and clearly in a way that perhaps our teammates are uh, less less well equipped to do what a great turnaround. This is like the interview question where somebody asks about your weakness and you tell them it's that you're just too passionate about your work. Okay, so why is it that, why why is it that, what is it, what is the special knowledge that testers have that make it so that nobody else should be doing what they do? I would say, I would say it's the um, adaptability and that, that ability to adopt different personas. You know, this this might be perhaps a little bit over overcooking it, but you know, developers all they really care about really is the new shiny. I mean, let's be honest. Like I've 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 worked with people who you know the latest version of C sharp comes out on a Friday and they spend their whole weekend get you know playing with this new version of C sharp. I mean, come on, people, let's get a life. The weekend is here for playing around with actual human beings, not tools. You can do that crap on Monday. And so I think testers are much, they're much more human, I think. And we're much more imaginative because we've taken quite often a more circuitous path into the role. Whereas, uh, you know, coders are more your more traditional, put the noise cancelling headphones on, go into the dungeon, do some stuff. I mean, I know that's a bit of a cliche, but there is an element of truth in there. So are, are you proposing that the mindset of coding is incompatible with the mindset you need for testing? Mm, I'm saying that it is nigh on impossible for people with that mindset to adopt any other mindset. That's what I'm saying. And so rather than trying to pull teeth and get them to do something that they're not very good at and probably don't want to do, um, we should just do it ourselves instead. Okay, last question. Uh, what should a project or that doesn't have an available um, person with tester in their title do to be able to release, uh, release and address the risks around their releases? Uh, they should probably first pray because they're in deep shit. Uh, and then what they should do after that is find some material by a chap called uh, Eric Progler, who has a whole raft of material about best practices. And they should apply all of those um, earn, as earnestly as they possibly can. That's their only chance in that situation. Um, because yeah. Eric is an expert tester of uh, multiple decades and he'll be able to pre-thought out any situations that they could be in. And uh, they should just use those as quickly as possible. Well, that is good advice. Uh, I guess it's time to turn it over. Uh, thanks. So, uh, Sam, drill as before, if you've got a question and you're prepared to ask it, please put your hand up. Uh, if you want to put it in the chat, then I'll, I'll ask it on your behalf. Does anybody have a question straight away? If not, I can go. Okay, I'll go. Uh, Vern, I, I don't think you made a case at all. I think you just um, slung abuse at uh, the people that you work with and butted up your mates. What, what, really, what is your case? I... I... I, I, found, I found it difficult to make a case because, it, to be honest, it felt a little bit obvious. Um, and I have been doing this for a long time and I have worked with some, with some folks who, 
who did demonstrate, I didn't just, you know, make these things up. I've worked with these people before. And so it, it, it felt very self-evident that we were in fact the best people to come up with the strategy because we are more imaginative and creative. So yeah, I did, I did struggle with that. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. You, you spotted me, you caught me out there, James, I'm guilty as charged. Thanks. Uh, anybody else with a question? Come on. He made a terrible case. Surely somebody can find an hole in it. They were dazzled by my argument. Thank you very much, James. Let's not pressure the audience. Well, friction alone will catch something something on the edge of the holes, I imagine. Oh, oh Alex. Shape. Alex. Yeah, shape Alex. Yeah. Okay, so let me try to ask you this. If these five group of people are so different and they hate each other, how a tester can succeed with uh, getting the, st the strategy in and, and provide success to a project? Well, being, being the ultimate wingman, they are able, I say they are, we are able to build those kind of bridges in a way that our teammates are often not very good at. And so it's not that those perspectives that our teammates have are completely irrelevant and useless. It's just that, you know, they're so siloed in their thinking that it takes somebody like us with, you know, personality and communication skills, imagination, to go and, you know, gather all those different viewpoints together and munge them together in something that is coherent and effective for our customers and our users. Thank you. Todd. Yeah, I, I had a question for you. Um, your assignment was to make the argument uh, that only a tester can make the test strategy. And somebody asked, uh, what do you do if you don't have a tester? Um, did you consider the option of not having a test strategy? Well, that's a, I mean, you know, that's a whole different talk right there. You know, people are banding around the word strategy when they mean plan or tactics. And, you know, that's just complete carnage. So I wanted to stay on mission because James is a very uh, hard taskmaster. So I just wanted to talk about why we're the best person to create the strategy. But that is an interesting point, Todd. Uh, and I would be welcome to come back and uh, argue for, you know, not having a test strategy. If James would have it. Uh, anytime, Alex. Uh, Vernon, um, what if at the start of a project, a project essentially is, is uh, a, the solution to a problem. People come together. There's, there's no tester. People come together from different backgrounds, from customer support, from development, design, product. Even users come together and discuss the problem, discuss the potential solution. Um, these people have very good quality conversations. They get common understanding, but there's still no tester there. Why can't they or one of them create a test strategy after having these really good conversations? Different personas, different ideas, different solutions. I guess, I guess if you're going to be really specific, it's not that they can't, it's just that it won't be very good. So, you know, I sing every day in the shower, but Beyonce has not taken my calls to open for her on her world tour. And that's because I'm not very good at singing. So I do sing, but I'm just not very good at it. And so likewise with our teammates, do they have these quality conversations? They absolutely do. Do they have them with our customers and facilitate those? They absolutely do. But are they as effective as if you were to facilitate those conversations or if you were part of the conversation, Alex? I'm going to say a hearty, with my whole chest, five toes down, no way, it would be terrible. You need to be there because you are the expert in the room. And it would, you know, go from being a very terrible, you know, flimsy strategy to something that was a work of art and beautiful and incredible and everybody would be happy uh, to execute it. So that's, that's what I'm saying. Cheers. Uh, last one, and it's from Dan in the chat. Um, where do the half-bloods, the software developers in test, fall in this uh in or out <laughs> binary opposition that you've got going well 
you know, I personally think that they're okay because um, they, you know, I, I, I'll allow their presence. No, jokes aside, I think they're okay because their their goal is the same as mine. They may go, they may be a little bit too, you know, toolsy and programmery for my, you know, tastes, I guess. But you know, their their goal is this is the same as mine, and we have similar conversations. They may just go about it slightly differently to me. But yeah, you know, they're okay. Great. Uh, thank you very much. That's that's your ten minutes. And oh uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I really enjoyed that. And I particularly enjoyed you throwing Eric's best practices back in his face. That was such a boomerang. It was it was wonderful. Um, <laughs> Vern, uh, Eric, do you want to say something? Oh yeah. <laughs> the boomerang returns to the sender. I just want to say that that's the point of that metaphor. <laughs> Um, you've got 10 minutes now, Vern, uh, to reflect on the experience of trying to come up with the, uh, the case for something you don't truly believe. That was, I found that ridiculously difficult because I just don't believe that at all. So I almost, I like, I almost had to adopt, well, not almost, I adopted a different like persona. Um, like I've, I've, I've seen some, I've seen some absolute just wild opinions on LinkedIn and so there's this one conversation that I had with a guy called Tony Bruce that some of you may have met or have heard of. And I remember he, he pinged me this link. And he's like, do you know this guy? And so I followed the link on LinkedIn. I can't remember the gentleman's name, but he was, he was basically saying, you must not share your test strategy with your developer teammates because then they will cheat and they won't make any bugs because they'll be trying to... And I was just like, what? So I was, I was trying to channel that guy like i was just trying to say that's the guy who i'm going to be i am not vernon anymore i am you know lunatic guy from from linkedin and so that's what that's what i was trying to do and that was the only way i was able to get through it and it was difficult and i found it you know james rightly called me out like i was just i couldn't i found it difficult to come up with some good arguments about why this made sense so i just kind of leaned into you know I got a bit straw many, if I'm being honest, but you know, I thought I would try and win people over with humor rather than an actual logical argument. Uh, and it was very funny. But what did you kind of find any elements of truth in what you were saying? I mean, obviously, you, you kind of said there's experience in that there, but I mean, yeah. to, to what extent are the, um, the generalizations and the stereotypes true for you? So I, so, I, so I have, or I feel like I've definitely worked with, <clears throat> excuse me, designers who gave no thought whatsoever to how practical this thing was to implement. Like that is, that is a fact. I've worked with those kind of people and you can do that throughout the whole thing, throughout the, you know, each different role. And there's a bunch of other roles that I didn't include, excuse me. But the thing is, you know, for me, they, they were, they were the worst of you know what i mean like it was very difficult to work with those people so even though people with those mindsets exist in those roles they were not they were not the most effective people in their roles so the most effective project managers that i've worked with and that, and that were fun to work with like they really wanted to know your opinion on what was going on so they were like they were like they'll come and say look you know we we do have a deadline and we do have a budget like what are the threats to that like please let me know so i can go and do something about it like what's getting in your way? What's slowing you down? I want to know so I can go and, you know, have the rows that you that you can't have or won't have or whatever. So, um, yeah, I think I, there's definitely some truth in 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 that image and my experiences with people in those roles and other roles. But generally speaking, they weren't like they weren't the you know the Michael Jordans of their of their roles. They were more like I don't know. I can't think of a terrible basketballer. Yeah. <laughs> perfect then let's stop there um thank you very much uh Vern, and also to eric who's had to drop off and thank you to you all for coming um i hope you enjoyed it the recording will be up on youtube in, in the next uh, couple of days and hopefully we'll do this again because i don't know about the rest of you but frankly i just really love this for uh thanks everybody cheers james thanks everyone